This is the Non-Typical Nation Podcast with your hosts, Brody Teal and Eric Labrie. Let's talk hunting and absolutely everything else that goes with it. Okay, what is going on, everybody? We're back for another Non-Typical Nation Podcast with myself and Eric Labrie. Today, we have a guest. He is the master of trout and a <laughs> badass bow hunter. We've got Charlie Reed. He's one of our Non-Typical Nation Pro staff um yeah he uh had a fun exciting season a bit of a struggle like all of us but you stuck with it yeah it was pretty slow start uh saw a lot of a lot of game throughout the season but uh had a real hard time getting close to them getting them in that bow range where i was really comfortable taking a shot and being effective at that range and it's a totally different game well, that's what separates the men from the boys, though, right? Yeah, I yeah. guess that's so. Why yeah, we bow hunt. yeah you I'm, held on to that bow to the very end. Yeah, I try to every year. Um, two years ago, I was able to get my first buck. It was, you know, just a spike, but uh, it's minus 23 out, and, you know, I put a good shot on it. And that was my first harvest with my bow. Uh, and then uh, this year, like I said, I was uh, lucky there late in the season on the 21st and uh, ended up taking a deer that uh, I was real happy with. First ever self filmed hunt. So. That was another accomplishment there that was pretty uh, pretty nice hurdle to get over because it is a totally different challenge trying to capture everything. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. You just like bow hunting is tough. Bow hunting is really tough. And then you add that camera on there as well. So you have that deer coming in. And so you not only got to w- get him into your range, but you also got to get your camera on him. And then if he moves 30 feet, well, then you got to adjust your camera before you can do anything. Uh, so you're adding a whole another struggle and just, you know, it's it's not you easy. You got to remember at minus 20 in a tree yeah. stand, every time you move that camera, there's a little creak or a moan from your tree stand as you shift direction. And these animals, they, uh, they have one job out there and that's to survive. Uh, you know, everyone thinks it's the rut, so they're going to be running around crazy and defenseless, but they wake up in the morning and their job is to survive. Uh, they breed, uh, they breed, uh, you know, after that. They can't breed if they're not alive, so that was their number one goal, and if they hear something or smell something or anything, they're out of there. It's insane how in tune they are. Absolutely insane. And all year round, too, you know, whether they're whether it's early season or late season, um, you know, I've been busted just by taking a headphone out of my ear, 20 feet up in the tree. They just, they they just know that's, that's their, that's their home, right? They, they've got her locked down. So what else were you chasing? Just deer or? Uh, you know, I stick to deer. I yeah. didn't get any draws this year. So, uh, I, I, I don't have a ton of experience hunting elk or moose. Uh, you know, they're not really abundant in the areas I hunt so I, I basically stick to deer hunting but my priority is getting up there for moose so I'm really hoping next year I get to go after one of the two giants that are on the property nice. that I hunt and they're they're frequenting the same spots quite regularly I think if I get the opportunity to to hunt during the rut I think I can stick one with my bow and I'm hoping next year to do that with my traditional bow so wow yeah jesus i don't that's even awesome. want to think of that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> traditional man that's yeah. a killer is it a high priority zone where you're hunting for a moose i believe they did another survey over the past couple of years on the population and they upped it from seven to a nine priority wow I believe. Oh, so that's, that is that's just a rumor i can't yes. so i can't almost, put any facts down, almost 10 years to get a moose draw there. wow i've had one since i moved to alberta wow so, that's crazy yeah. and so what about the have you looked into the late season draw or you want that rut i, I want the rut huh? yeah uh just i want to get close yeah i mean i, I don't want to just cruise around in a pickup truck and and end up filling my tag i want to experience it and get you know 10 15 yards from it when i shoot and yeah that's you know. the time to do it yeah that's for sure i think that first yeah. week of october is, yep. is kind of yep. crucial to that so yeah, yeah being absolutely. able to call although if you heard me calling moose it would probably probably <laughs> scare you so <laughs> maybe yeah. i'll bring one of you guys for my moose hunt. <laughs> i thought that too and i had a draw tag three years ago i think it was <clears throat> and man i struggled i hunted a lot and i just could not get it done it's tough and it was for north of town here and uh, it was really really tough you know i'd see one but it was in the wrong zone on the wrong side of the road or whatever right it was always something and yeah. i just couldn't get it done well i think that um, was probably all leading up to this year maybe for you yeah well and that's sort of what i'm getting at is is that was like my first year ever even trying to call a moose and I thought I was pretty close. Like, I'm sure if there are moose there, I could have pulled something or whatever. But this year, um, we've had a lot of encounters. We've played around with them a lot. I'm going to shut this off. 
we've played around with them a lot. And uh, once you have them in close and you can hear them, then you sort of realize the sounds that you got to make. Um, and yeah, like we, I think we probably had four or five encounters with bulls where we've called them in right close and it's just a ton of fun. When That's those guys, when those it's guys are looking for fun. cows or looking for a fight, they'll come right in close. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. that's something I've never been a part of yet, right? I've I've harvested a moose before, but it was at a distance and, you know, it was just more luck of the draw. I was in the cut block he was in and, uh, you know, I happened to put the right shot on him. But uh, I've only seen in videos of guys calling these moose in and they come in and just kind of swaying back and forth side to side. And I don't know, that just gives me goosebumps. So I can't wait. Yeah. yeah, that's the best. That's yeah, crazy, yeah. Best. And our, our last day of elk hunting this year with uh, Steve and with Smith Game Calls. Um, so I had already used my moose tag, and this was, yeah, I think it was the last day of archery moose. I think it went to like the 23rd. 23rd. Yeah. And um, he didn't have his bow with him, but he did have a moose tag. And uh, sure enough, you know, our last day, we hear a grunt, and so we're like, let's play with this thing. And yeah, we pulled him right into like 15 yards it was just insane. Like Steven was in front of me filming and I'm just sitting back calling and also filming. We we're like, let's just have fun. And this thing just came right up to Steven and he turned around and he's like, fuck, is this thing going to run over me? Yeah, they, <laughs> get, just, they get so curious. Oh, the and the, the, we got real cool footage too. So we're going to yeah. work that into that episode. And yeah, that was really cool. But even getting one with the rifle on a, on a cup block or something like that, just to fill that tag. Oh, so, it's just it's to amazing. approach yeah. that when you walk on the up, ground too. Absolutely. Yeah. When you walk up to a moose for your first time, like myself, I'm from Nova Scotia, so I had never seen a moose until okay. I moved to Alberta, right? And next thing you know, I'm hunting one, and I got one on the ground, and I'm by myself, and all of a sudden, I realized that this is a lot more to it, right? Like, uh, you know, as I think I was 23, 24 years old, you know, a pretty young guy, pretty naive to how much work yeah. actually went into one of these animals. I thought, oh, hey, I'll just quarter it up and pack it out on my shoulder from <laughs> yeah. this yeah. kilometer two marker no. out in knee high snow hey i couldn't even lift a quarter i, 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 I was just gonna up. say i couldn't like I, that's what i thought too because i was by myself so i'm like okay i gotta quarter this thing get it as close as i can to the trail and then quad it out and so i quartered it and i'm like i can't i can barely lift this quarter I, I so what did you do how'd you get it out I called in reinforcements yeah. and uh, i ended up calling my father-in-law who called his buddy with a quad and a tub trailer and he came out quartered it up and we got it in the quad trailer and yeah i think i mean it, it was it cost me a bit of meat it wow. was it wasn't an easy <laughs> quad drive yeah. for the guy that helped me out so i was pretty grateful there that he was uh, willing to come out and kind of rat bag his quad a bit that day yeah. for me it's a job that's for sure it oh, is and yeah. even more than an elk like i got my elk when we got when i got my elk i could lift one of those legs up and remove the quarter but the moose was so much bigger like he had to have been 200 pounds i'd say more than the elk was and even the bull i got like field dress he was 580 pounds and this moose when he was down on the ground i was like oh my what have i got myself into <laughs> and i'm like yeah, maybe, well let's just start quartering this thing and maybe someone like yourself who's exposed to these animals every day in your shop doesn't understand it but like for me when i walk in i don't see elk or moose a lot yeah i'm used to deer you know that's what i have at my house and stuff so when i walk in here and i come in the door and there's an elk shoulder mount beside yeah. me i'm like oh my god okay yeah. when i get that tag i need to be prepared i need to be ready for it right like yeah so here's hoping next year a guy draws that moose tag and maybe we can get something down i, I need some help though with the calling because i uh i tried calling on one bull and he was having none of it so give me a call yeah, okay. eric's, good, the, good. yeah no, eric's I, the moose master i uh, can use all the tips that yeah. Uh, yeah. in the world we'll make you, it happen you can fill a football stadium with what i don't know about moose <laughs> <laughs> so. well that makes two of us man yeah. that makes two but of i us. guess luck's a big part of it so that's all that matters yeah right place right luck time man a little that bit is... of moose chatter oh yeah. yeah no i from the videos i've seen that's kind of vital to it all you need to speak their language a bit and you know i watched this one video of a guy and he was pulling them from you know probably at least a half a kilometer away across cup blocks and these things were, as soon as they heard that, they were snapping their head around and on a straight line right to the sound. And, you know, this one guy, I mean, he called in moose after moose after moose that day. And I'm sure he edited the video, but um, still, I bet you I've tried calling to 
probably 10 different bull moose and i i don't think i've ever had one one respond to me right some so, guys just have the knack yep, man it's, it's like not me john who we had in here and uh, on a previous podcast he's a big wolf trapper um, okay. but he's a native guy right so he like he knows that bush like the animals know that yep. bush um, we got some bears with him this spring and it's just unreal the knowledge he has and he sent me probably 15 videos this fall of him calling moose in. And so he'd just call him in just to play with him. Nice. And and then he'd let him let him run off or whatever so his son could see it or whatever, right? And some guys just have that knack. It is unreal. It's so much fun. Yeah. yeah. yeah I follow a guy on Instagram, actually. He's a, I, I'm not sure where he's from. His name is Wasey. But uh, he's I think he's from like the Fort Assiniboine area. And okay. it seems like every day, man, this guy is... You got a moose coming in on a dead line to him or he's putting he's got put a wolf down or i think he shot about 175 inch white tail this year wow. like he's doing it with traditional tackle <laughs> like he's the guy's an animal right so it's 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 cool to see guys like that in action it's, yeah some guys especially around here some guys really have the knack for all that yeah. stuff like yeah. Well, you know, it's it's all just getting knowledge of the area you're hunting, the animals you're hunting, because, you know, animals are going to act different, whether they're in an agricultural area or a heavily forested area. Um, so it's just getting to know the area and the animals, yeah. you know, and it takes a long time. It does, yeah. Especially, Learning from your mistakes. Yeah, yeah, especially around here where you can't see... 100 yards ahead of you. All mm-hmm. you can see is bush. So you got to know what's behind that tree line and for the next you know, however, however long. And you got to be ready all the time. All the time, because something could pop out of that bush at 60 yards and you get three seconds and that's it. I think that has a lot to do with a testament to how important uh, scouting is. Without, And I'm not saying that scouting isn't important in a prairie setting or where you can see farther distances. Of course it is, right? But uh, when you're hunting thick bush, you know, and you're zoning in on, you know, mature animals, bedding areas where they're most comfortable and most at ease, um you know you can do a lot of damage by just traipsing through the bush and scaring them all out of there so yeah. you, you hunting the bush you really have to be careful that you don't intrude those sanctuary areas and pressure those mature animals out of the areas where they're comfortable because sometimes they just don't come back right um like i'm no expert but i i personally have done that yeah uh, to to a really good buck that i uh, uh i just was getting trail camera photos of and you know um, like I said, with this thick bush, you, you go in and check those trail cameras, you know, you're leaving scent behind that you don't think you're leaving behind, but these animals know that guy, yeah. you know, like I was getting pictures of them June, July, August. And then all of a sudden I tried to step up how quick I was going in and checking those cameras, trying to get his timing down. Next thing you know, gone, never saw yeah. him again. That's so, crazy. you know, like hunting the bush up here, it has a lot of challenges that I'm sure you guys can attest to. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. You got a pattern. Well, especially with white tails, that's the, all you can do is pattern them. Yeah, I've I arguably would say, and I would argue this to people that a bush white tail up north in just vast forest is probably one of the hardest animals to individually hunt. Like, yeah, you could drive around all day and you might see five or six, but if you find two or three bucks that you want to hunt, you want to harvest those ones. Um, I would argue that that is as hard or harder um, than nearly any other species. To, to single one out. To single yeah, one out and sure. pinpoint him Have down in the thick buck. bush. Yeah, I can, Absolutely. I can second that, boys. I've been five seasons now targeting a deer and haven't yeah. got him yet. Yeah, no, me so. too. I've got an absolute cranker, like just a giant. And you see him, you see him basically from March until the end of august and then he's gone then he disappears and you might get the odd photo of him like one in november maybe a couple in december but he knows as soon as that rut kicks in he's moving to where there are no gunshots where he's not going to see anyone one good thing about deer like that though is uh you know they're very habitual animals okay um from what i've read and from what i've seen on my own personal trail cameras for instance that deer I've been tracking for four or five years is a deer I call Frosty. Now, I have four daytime photos of that deer. Three of them are from the same fence post on the same deer day of the year, three consecutive years in a row. At the same day, between noon and 1 p.m. 
So three years in a row, that deer walked by the same fence post on the same day within an hour of each other, yes. three years in a row. And that's what I noticed with this deer too. He's like, when I first seen him five years ago on camera, he was probably a three-year-old deer. So now he's seven, eight years old, but I've noticed that too. He's in front of the same camera using the same trail almost the exact same time of year. That's right. So maybe a thing that you might want to consider with that deer is looking at where he is on bow season opener. Yes. And well, that's what I've been trying. To yeah, because that you know they like I'm no I'm not trying to profess to be an expert yeah. by any means, but I do find deer a little easier to get a wrap on when they're in feeding patterns as opposed to rutting patterns. Yeah. Yes. Um I, agree. They, I I know a lot of people think deer just free roam in the rut and they just go crazy and blow up their ranges. But I mean there's a lot of documentation that proves that's not true. The you know, there's a lot of studies that show that mature bucks will actually shrink their range during the rut oh. and use only a percentage of their home range during that rut because a lot of times they're in lockdown with does and Well, it all boils down to does, right? Yeah. And that's why I I like I will never shoot a doe where my where these big That was bucks my next question. Because we gotta keep those does at least in that area so these bucks keep coming around. Because if there's no does there, the bucks aren't gonna come around. And that was one thing I was worried about. I actually spoke to the fish and wildlife officer about this and asked him, I said, like, is it possible that all the does in my area are bred? So these deer have moved out of my area because I'm like, at one point I hadn't had a buck come through in like a week and I'm, and I'm like, what the hell is going on? And he said, yeah, without a doubt, if, if you got like five or six does in that immediate 300 yard area, 400 yard area, he said, those bucks will move on to somewhere else. Um, you know, so I actually I listened to a podcast the other day about that, and they oh, okay, uh, <clears throat> the people were referring to those deer as they called them homecoming bucks. Oh, okay. So, what they said was basically these deer will live in a summer range for feeding patterns close to food, mm -hmm. safe. They know it's before hunting season where they're not going to have people coming through the bush, scaring them out of their bedding areas, and then those deer leave because they know that the population of does isn't high enough to sustain the amount of bucks in that yeah. area. So they'll leave, breed does elsewhere, and then they come back to their summer ranges looking for does that are late to come into heat. So yeah, that makes sense. That's, uh, you know, th this was just something I was listening to. This isn't my theory. I'm, I'm pawning this that off of someone else, but 100% total sense. Yeah. And that why it fr that's why it frustrates me a bit that they do have that, two doe tag where the supplemental tag in some of these zones where you can get a couple does but i don't think that zone you can get to i think you can just use one of those right that's right a lot of, they've limited it yeah. a yeah. lot so you got, but you can still use your supplemental and then in your general and eliminate two does that way too yeah. um but we had this conversation on the last podcast where you got to put faith in those biologists and you know they're the ones that are are making these rules and, and you got to you got to see yeah. what's going on down in the United States right now with the deer too, right? I mean, and even in the southern parts of Alberta with chronic wasting and EHD yes. and things like that, we don't want that here. We don't want that. So if that means yeah. hunters shooting a couple extra deer, exactly. or, you know, like unfortunately for people that are against hunting, that's something they might have to deal with so that we don't yeah. have deer running around, you know, doing circles in the middle of intersections in the highways, right? Because these we've seen in video what they do to the deer, the CWC and EHD, it just destroys them. Yeah, and so. uh, there's no cure. Nope. No cure yet. I nope. seen a press release though, about a year ago where someone came out with something. Don Higgins. It's Did Don Higgins it? from Real Real World Wildlife Products. Okay. He, he was working on a mineral lick. Okay. Because yes. he has captive deer. Yeah. But he also hunts his own farm wildly, like with wild deer. Yeah. So he has a captive herd and he's, I believe I read that he found a mix of a trace mineral and some kind of antibiotic or some kind of medicine that they mixed in and it actually prevented it. Yes. Because I believe it's some kind of parasite in stagnant water that embeds in the brain. Yeah, I, a, I don't quote prion, don't quote me on that. It's a pre Yes, I had heard of that attractant and supplement products with that mixed in. Yeah. And, and there I are a few brands that sell it. We were thinking of doing something like that with Antler Obsession because um down south, southern Alberta, it's bad. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you know, Saskatchewan is bad too. Southern Alberta is really bad though. Um, you know, I had a guy last year bring in three or four mule deer and uh shot one. Got it tested, CWD, so they gave him another tag. Shot oh, another one, this. got tested. He got four, four in a row, same area. And that's what they notice is there's pockets, right? Yeah. And uh, 
you know, I've talked to other guys who did the, who just wiped out a whole pile of deer in one area when they did a, a call, I think it was in the early 2000s or something. And, uh, you know, they killed like 500,000 deer just to control the CW doing that area. And I uh, think they're doing that in Illinois right now. The yeah, but season's they don't, over and they're bringing in sharpshooters. Back, right? So yeah, it's, that's too bad. What do you do? I don't know. Yeah, the, and you have to get rid of it because it doesn't yeah. go away. It well, lives, yeah. that stuff lives in the soil. Yeah, hun- yeah, hun- hunting. Hunting. you got to kill. Oh, you got yeah, sure. to regulate the population, the population and yeah, you know, make sure they're not starving and having having issues with food and you know, if that means you know hunters do their part in that, yeah. then that's what we got to do, right? I mean, I'd rather see people ethically harvest and and eat the deer then have them go to waste on the side of the road and be hit by people or yes you know and drive up our insurance rates by strikes on the side of the highway and killing people you know yeah well, exactly and, well and if the government if the government kills them then they're just they don't have any any exactly. value anymore that's right costing, you're taking, you're that's taking right. the value away from them if it's you let people costing hunt the them, government money. Yeah. giving them value yeah, you exactly. get money that goes back to conservation so that everything. being yeah. said boys what's your guys's policy on hunting does where you hunt your where, where you're targeting a buck yeah, I just won't just because yeah, that's where I, I want to get too. a nice buck so bad. But I will. Like, we didn't get any does this year. Um, but if I'm going to go cherry pick in a different area, that's what and I, I see a well. bunch of does, and I'm going to get it. But my, like, four or five deer areas where I, you know, try and pattern those bucks, and I sort of know it's in the area, I will not shoot a doe in those areas. Yeah, and for me, for me, yeah. it's kind of like uh, tree stand hunting is buck hunting. Yes. And then I, I just go, if I am if I need some Fair meat enough. deer, we go and truck hunt, and yeah. that, that way we can do it with the family or whatever. Yep, it's a little absolutely. bit easier for everybody. That's exactly. a good way to and look at it. We get to do some chicken hunting at the same time. But tree stand hunting, if I'm going to go sit in the stand and freeze my ass off or swap mosquitoes all day, whatever time of year it is. Yeah. I'm hunting for a buck. I'm mature. Yeah, a lot too depends on where. Obviously, it all depends on where I'm hunting, right? Like where we do our elk hunting, um, it's a draw mule deer tag, and there's a lot of muleys in that zone. And this year, when we went back to do some moose hunting for two days, it was just nice and short, never got anything. But we counted something like 20 mule deer does. Just insane. Hmm. I would grunt for moose, and these does would walk right up to me cool yeah it was just insane like we had cell phone footage of of these does like 10 feet away from us amy's just shitting her pants because there's a doe and a fawn and it was just a ton of fun but that area there you see nothing but does all day long Um, so you know if that's the case um you know that is a zone yeah yeah for sure but that is a zone where uh where I'll put in for a doe tag, and oh, if yeah. I get it, well, then I'll remove a doe. But at least, you know, my white tail spots where you see almost more bucks than does in these spots, not a chance. I definitely won't uh, want you to doe. But. That probably has a lot to do with why those bucks are so tricky because of the low, yeah. well, sorry, the high buck to doe ratio in that yeah. area, right? You know, and it's... They're it, moving lots. The, yeah, and there is. Like, there's probably... You know, I, it's it's probably two to one. It's probably, you know, it's probably two to one buck to doe ratio. Um, but every year there's always, you know, a couple does so, with two or three fawns. But it's just they don't stay in that area. Does that affect the way you'll hunt an area? The, the, the buck to doe ratio, will that change how you approach an area knowing that it's a higher it has a higher doe ratio like yeah, we you you hunt it differently? I'm not educated enough in deer hunting to really know whether or not that should differently like i know the basics like i'm not going to shoot a doe because i want the bucks to come in during the rut um but we were talking the other day like it was such a struggle this year that uh i'm close to just like abandoning those spots and trying to find new spots just because i spent so much time in the stand and just couldn't get it done um i think so, that yeah, uh i, I think that just hunting in this bush that we have here it's it, so it hard, all man. comes down to the variables right if you got high does High doe population, you're going to have higher variables. There's going to be a higher chance that, that buck's going to catch a hot doe trail when he's doing his daily route or whatever, right? Like yeah. That happened to me in late September <laughs> and, uh, to and, a T. And what are you going to do? I yeah. mean, there's like you can pattern a deer as, as best you can. You know where he beds, you know, three nights of the week and or every 10 days, whatever. You know that he does this circle. But when it comes down to it, he could go one way around a big tree yeah. or he could go the other way around a big tree. That we would, like, yeah, it's like you say, condi- we, conditions are vital. I mean, I don't know how many times I climbed a stand this year and climbed right down when the wind changed. Well, like and, you, and you have to do that kind of stuff because every time you're in a stand and you're giving your scent to the deer, you're educating every mature animal in that area, not just the deer, the moose, the elk, everything. You're telling them, okay, 
there's something out of the ordinary in yeah. this area. I smell it. I can't see it yet, but red flags are up. Something and, that's here that's yeah, not here see, the rest of the year. That's right. And, and that's now all of a sudden, they have a they got a bad kind of association with that spot. And you know, like like I said earlier, like mature animals, they're they're surviving from sun up to sundown mm-hmm. and even after dark, they're surviving, right? So they got that negative association with that area, a bad smell, a mm-hmm. bad sound. You cracked off a shot at a wolf earlier in the season or something. They might never come by there again, right? Yeah, and trail cameras are a really good tool for seeing that, right, firsthand. And I think the guys that kill huge bucks every year, especially in the same or similar areas, what they're doing is they have a bunch of different options, you know, three or four tree stands set up in yeah. the area. They have a dozen cameras set up in the area or whatever, and they know the buck's larger area instead of just one small one small area that he's passing mm-hmm. through or he's feeding in. Yeah, I agree 100%. So I got- you just got to maximize your options here. Yeah. Like, it's all... it's. A lot of it's luck too, right? A guy I try to model my deer hunting after, his name is Don Higgins, I mentioned earlier, and he runs 50-some cameras. He's got 25, 30 stands on, you know. He travels through three different states checking cameras and putting stuff up. But he shot 168-inch whitetail on October, or what was it, November the 1st, and then went out the next morning and shot a 172-incher. So, you know, he shot basically two... you know, Boone and Crockett box yeah. in 12 hours. And last year he shot two 200 inch deer in the same year or in the same week. Sorry. Wow. Two yeah, 200 inch whitetail with bow in the same week. That's insane. Like, so do you, so have, you know, he's doing something right. Right. Yeah, so when he says doubt. something, you can, you know, put a little faith in it. Right. So but like you said, right. When the wind changes, you got to get and down he does. from the stand. Yeah, that's that's he, where I he, learned that. Then he's got another stand for when that wind is yep. blowing in that direction. And that's he's what like, I was going to ask. Go to this one. Absolutely. So you've got several stands. Oh, absolutely. And so you're hunting private property or I have enough big... stands to hunt every wind direction. Nice. Exactly. Right there to other than like South, Southeast, I can go South southeast east all the way around yeah. i have a stand you know like everyone has a stand that's like that go jackpot stand yes. it's like this just feels right i'm yeah. gonna get a big buck here <laughs> but i have a stand to essentially hunt because i don't have all the time in the world to hunt now so if i get say two days uh, a month to go hunting uh, I, I can't really say oh, I can't hunt today because the wind's not right. I need to have a backup plan. I need to be able to go sit on a on a downwind side of a bedding area somewheres, right? Uh, you know, but if you can put yourself in that kind of a situation on your property at all times, you're you're gonna have some success. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So are you doing all day sits? Like you getting in there before dark till after dark? Are you hunting waste mostly mornings or evenings? This what do you prefer? Year, this year was a huge learning experience for me. Um, I think I did a lot more harm than good early in the year. I think I put too much time in the woods. Um, as the season progressed, I found myself seeing more bucks by being in the woods less, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, if you pick the proper times to get in that stand, you'll see more. And if you go into that stand when the conditions aren't right, you're going to burn it out quick and you might have one good sit in that stand. You might have another good night, but that's going to be it. You're going to burn that stand out. All the mature animals are gone. So I screwed up a lot this, this year, you know, and I, I, uh, I spent too much time in the bush. I checked my cameras too much. I put my scent in there too much, but, uh, your, to answer your question, um, I, I don't see much point in hunting whitetails in the morning until the rut. Uh, I don't think I'll ever hunt whitetails again into, until November. Really, Unless just because last couple last couple of hours of light. And and why is that? Just because they you don't have them coming in that early, or it's just tough to get in. Because if you're trying to get in before that deer is there at six a.m. or five thirty a.m. Yeah, more like four in I August agree. And or I, September, because your sunrise is super early, and these deer are feeding all night. Yeah, when they're in their summer feeding patterns, I sat there all year this year and watched. The does will come out 20 minutes, a half hour before dark, and the bucks will come 20 yards back of the field's edge. They'll take a look around, see the does out there, and they'll lay down wow. 20 yards back in the bush, and they'll wait till the darkness. And as soon as darkness, they get up and they walk out into the field and field with the, feed with the does, right? So, you know, to get into that field that next morning while those deer are still in there feeding and not educate them to your 
Yeah, it's your tough. goal. It's tough. You're you're just doing more harm than good, I think, in that situation. And and I did it a lot this year. And I think next year I'll have a lot more success and I'll have better stands by staying out of them. Yeah. Right. I think it's just I, I, from what I learned this year. I think the key is to wait until the timing's right, wait until the conditions are right, and executing your plan. Don't yeah, I think my it. wife would be a lot happier. If I think I, I can agree with that. that. <laughs> well, and like see, I, said, I spent a lot of days where I'd go. In, I always try and get out there like half hour before legal hunting time. So that's an hour before the sun rises. That's right. And it it's early. Like when I got my moose, I was in that stand at like I think it was like six a.m. Early, early, early. Um, and then it's long sits, especially that time of year because you're sitting from six a.m. until. 8 30 at night or whatever it is and you like you're mentally going insane by your yeah. 12th or 13th yeah, that, hour no, that second day and it's of the a season. struggle it was sun up to sun down i think it was a 14 hour sit that second day and yeah it is it's a it, it starts to play games with yeah. you after a while right and that's another thing you got to think of it's a long season yeah. yeah you know like you're out there in august you got three more months of chasing deer of early mornings and wake up calls when yeah. your alarm's going off in late nights and putting kilometers on your boots right like it's it's a long season it's a grind and that's it is you know what you got to consider come time to put your bow away right yeah i love that early season though i don't think i could sit in a tree stand in august really i don't think i physically could sit in a tree stand. oh man that's my favorite time i love it i love it other than the bugs i don't know like i sitting in november when it's minus 30 and you're in a tree with no cover, freezing your balls that's the, off. That's tree stand season for Fuck, me. man. Yeah, I can't stand that. But, like, I, gotta I did be, it. I got to be in the like mountains it. or chasing elk in August, though. I couldn't find myself. Yeah, see, I you, don't think, like, whitetail is way down on the list. You have a totally different skill set than white me, right? Tail, you yeah. have the skills to go after those animals. See, I'm, how I I'm usually green, do it so. is my first week of archery is for whitetails. And then once you get into your sort of second week of September, then you start transitioning to elk. But you got your sheep right off the yeah. bat, right? So sheep is the, that first 10 days of the season. And yeah. And it's like right into early elk. Yeah. And that's not that early. Like the rut is hard sometimes, right? Oh, yeah. In early September. So. Yeah. But see, a velvet whitetail is so high on my list. That, oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Like a nice heavy framed whitetail with, with some, yeah. Yeah, it, it would <laughs> that's be. That's up there for me too, yeah. man. Yeah. I got the velvet yeah. moose though, so that was cool. That's really yeah, cool, that's man. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the chance. I was pretty pumped that seeing tough. that on the second day of bow season. You already posted oh, man. a picture. Yeah. I could not believe it. I got yeah. out of the mountains and I was like, motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, Brody. Yeah. 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 I'm like, well, this isn't supposed to happen right now. I didn't now. even see a sheep and then I look, first thing I look on Facebook is Brody's moose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was good getting the team on the board because I got to be honest, boys, there was a period of time where them guys from Saskatchewan sure carried the team. Oh, yeah. Well, last <laughs> they, year, the end yeah. of last year, yeah, they were kicking ass. Those yeah, boys put get down some big, some big deer this year, man. Big deer. Yeah, they did real well, which was good to see, right? They worked yeah. hard at it too, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, hunting season's done. We're getting into ice fishing. Here we go. You getting excited? I'm pumped. I got yeah. myself a little ice fishing shack this year, and nice. I'm just starting to get it dressed up on the inside. And, Did you build one or what? Uh, I actually bought a framed one off a guy who just builds the shells oh, okay. and lets people design the inside like they want, right? So wow. essentially it's, uh, what was it? It was 12, 14 by 10. Holy smokes. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's uh, I'll have some bunk beds in there, and yeah. it'll be the walleye cabin, man. I can't wait. I'll have it out on... 27 feet of water on Slave Lake in no time. Yeah. I, think, I saw a report today. There's 12 inches of clear ice on Slave already. I mean, that's a little early for me. I saw one that's me, 16 yesterday. Is that right? 16 really? inches, yeah. I usually don't go out there till after New Year's. No, I okay. wait but, too, yeah. uh, You don't need to be the guy that falls in. Yeah, no doubt. Ah, it's just, it's, yeah, I got Nobody's fallen in Slave yet this year, though, right? Really? No. I don't usually think. there's always someone. I don't like, think on Slave, but there's it's, a few everywhere else. I noticed yeah. driving in today that the heave's starting, though, so there'll be people trying to cross that, and they'll go in. Yeah, that's so, when it happens is yeah. when that big crack comes across. The crack yeah. comes across, and then they have a little bit of open water, and people try and kind of ramp it or whatever, and... That's usually when you see the issues, but I'm yeah. pretty pumped about it myself. Like I, like I said, I this time of year, if I get to go fishing, I try and go trout fishing. Okay. Uh, my favorite fish to fish is brook trout, uh, hands down, uh, and this is the best time of year for them. The colors are spectacular. They're all spawned up and ready to go. I, I don't know exactly when they spawn, but I think it's no- go. December, November, January, yeah. somewhere's around there, right? So I know I caught one that was... Uh, three pound 14 ounce male wow. uh, a couple years back and it was 
just after Christmas, and it was well, you guys did the mount for oh, okay. it, and it was the most spectacularly colored wow. fish I've ever seen. The I think oh, it's called vermiculation on the retro. back and all the camo patterns. It was unbelievable, and you know, uh, there's a few lakes in our area that if you just get off the beaten trail a little bit and uh, go exploring, you can, you know, there's some 10 pound trout kicking around out here, wow. right? So, wow. yeah. And that's what I was going to ask, like, cause you've got some trout hot spots. So how, how did you stumble upon these spots? Are you looking at aerial maps or Mostly, are you? Mostly, yeah. Aerial maps, okay. trout stalking programs, uh, look oh, at where okay. they've been putting the fish for how long. Then you talk to some locals, find out which ones are prone to winter killing and yeah. you know, which ones seem to live and, and have fish last longer. Right. Cause then you want to kind of, you know, there's a few lakes up there in the Swan Hills area that'll winter kill every second or third year. Oh, the wow. fish grow exponentially faster than in any other lake in that lake. Yeah. But they'll die every oh, third year. Wow. So yeah. you'll get 12 centimeter brook trout put in one year. And in the fourth year, the year that they'll winter kill, they'll be six pounds. Right? So in, in a, four, a, a four year old brook trout. brook trout being, or maybe, I guess it would be five years, but yeah. it, you know, that's a six, that's a big fish. I don't know if that you've ever caught fish, a six yeah. pound brook trout, but no. the day I was out there, a guy pulled one out and I just, I had to go over and hold it just because. You know, he pulled it out of his tent, and I had never seen anything like that. So wow. I just had to go over and ask him if I could see it, right? And it's you know just, just yeah, a lot of talking to locals, man, and yeah. you know, uh, not many people want to give up their fishing spots these days, right? Because it seems like social media kind of hits them hard once people find out. Like, I know there was a, a couple fellas they they went to this lake that I trout fish, and they put a video online, and the fish caught. He checked 250 licenses the next two days at that lake where wow. typically you could go 20 times a winter and not see anyone. Wow. So that's an, a testament to what like a, a web page on Facebook can do to there a There have been a site, lot of right? guys fishing so, at that lake though. Yeah, that yeah. The, the, over those next two days after those guys wow. posted their video, a four pound brook trout coming through the ice, everyone from Calgary and Edmonton was on their yeah. way up, right? Yeah. So, Holy you know, 250 smokes. people on that lake the next day, everyone keeping five fish, it's... Yeah, and that's and why I mean, you that see a lot matter. of guys. Everyone's entitled to that. We'll right? post but a picture of like a sturgeon or something, and then they'll shade out they the have, back. Yeah, that's the right. Back yeah. Photo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a it's a dog eat dog world out there. Yeah. I see guys getting their hats made up, spot poacher hats, and they really? oh, yeah, they'll, they'll steal your spot. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> they have no shame about that. But no, it's pretty good ice fishing. I mean, uh, it's it's we got such a long off season. We got to do something to get out yeah. there, right? Like yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pumped for shed hunting ice fishing i mean it all started i mean the day i shot my buck i took it home hung it and i put 13 trail cameras out the next day nice right so you know it started the next day my whitetail season right yeah. seeing what made it you know i bought 40 bales of alfalfa nice so you know i'm getting bales out to all the all the animals so they can you know have a, a long source of food yeah right yeah. not just a couple bales here and there you need to continue to feed them especially this the time winter, of year right? man it's important because it's you know there's almost no vegetation yeah you give them so something they, to eat they're gonna stick around yes yeah, yeah. so they sort of go that, though, into like a starvation mode so if they do have something like that it creates like a safe space for them yeah and uh, the key it's to feeding beneficial. them though is that you got to keep going with it right yeah because uh, yeah. their their digestive systems change in the winter time to kind of they eat more bark and, and tree-like stuff, and their digestive systems actually changes. So if you go and feed these high-carb foods to them after their digestive enzymes have changed, they'll go into what's called acid something. Uh, there's a term for it. It's aciditis or something oh, okay. like that. And wow. Anyway, it's a condition that will actually kill the deer. Yeah. So if you feed it and then stop feeding it all of a sudden, you've actually done a lot more harm than good mm -hmm. to your deer herd. So yeah. the key to doing it is, is sticking to it, right? So I read that and I instantly said, okay, well, five, ten bales isn't going to do it. So I said 40 bales, you know, and that'll, that'll take care of the winter. So hopefully wow. that'll keep that big double drop time buck of mine healthy and looking good. Put on 60, 70 inches for next year. Yeah, that's what you got to do, though. That's what yeah. you got to put wishful, the work in. That's wishful thinking, but yeah. Hopefully. Well, you know, and and that's what sort of the the struggle is with with deer hunting northern Alberta compared to like Saskatchewan and some of the agricultural areas where um, you know guys don't do that. They don't provide something in the off season. Um, where Saskatchewan, they do that all year round because they can they can hunt over bait, so they'll also provide food in the winter time, and and they're accustomed to that. Where around here they aren't, um, and so 
you know, if you aren't doing that, it's a, you know, it's a struggle. It is. And I mean, and, I've uh, already seen the benefits it's done. I went out to that property the other night and I counted 62 deer in the field. Wow. And I videotaped every one of them stand out. There was multiple, multiple 140, 150, 160 inch bucks. Holy smokes. In the group. And it was all on video and they're all out there, you know, eating that, eating the hay, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's doing good. And uh, like I said, they just, you know, keep, keep up with it. Right. And, yeah. You know, keep your keep your travel routes cleaned up from, you know, fallen trees and stuff that makes getting away from predators tough and do yeah. the little stuff to help and at least that'll make a guy feel better when you yeah. get out there and harvest one the next year, right? At least yeah, you're working yeah. for it and you're Yeah. It gives you, you know, a lot more confidence in your that's spot. Right. Too, I mean, those. and then, you know, if someone gives you grief for being a hunter, you say, Listen, this is what I do all year for these yeah. animals, right? Yeah. Like I don't I don't dog it. I don't dog house it. I'm not here shooting out of my window in my truck. I'm here. I care about them. Right? Yeah, exactly. You know? And that's why the, the baiting thing frustrates me so much because, uh, yeah, me too, you know, buddy. guys are like, it's not hunting, man. You know, like you're just putting food out there and the deer are just coming in or the bears, you know, they're just coming for a meal. You may as well shoot them in a can or whatever. But no, like baiting bears, you're almost, you're spending more time doing that. Absolutely. And setting up a good bait site and keeping it topped up. More work doing that than you would be just driving around shooting the first bear you see. Think of all the extra value you're adding to all the other animals that you're not yes. harvesting too so you're yeah. you're harvesting one bear at that bait site you're feeding 10 other bears yeah. well right? and the most important thing is that you get to watch those bears and you get to really look and examine it make sure you're shooting an Absolutely. old one you're targeting the one that you want not to mention you can wait for a nice ethical shot yeah, where they're not yeah, moving exactly. they're, they're they're you know comfortable and you get comfortable and you got lots of time and, and they always know you're there yeah, they know you're there, and and they know you know you're gonna sit in there for ten or fifteen days and watch a lot of bears, and you're just gonna you know there's gonna be that one moment where you decide, okay, this is the one, and that's why I'm all for it because you'll have a lot more more mature animals being harvested than spikers or two year old deer or whatnot because you know what's coming through, you know what to wait for, and uh, yeah, I just think it's. Cuts down on the variables. Yep. Yeah, and we've beaten that one down quite a bit, though. <laughs> and I mean, as far as managing your property goes, too. Let's say you've got a property with a ton of deer on it, where you can justify harvesting a few. Yeah. Well, you might want to cull a couple deer. Okay. You yeah. know, you might have some genetics in there, and I'm no expert on this. I don't know much about it, but I see a lot of guys culling genetics out of the population they don't want. That might be a great opportunity for that right set up a bait pile exactly wait for that one deer to come in that you you know has the busted off left side or has a limp on his leg or you know got hit by a car or whatever the case may be that's a great opportunity to target that one deer whereas if that's a wild deer that was maybe clipped by a vehicle it's not coming out of thick bush no. ever again probably it's nope. it's gonna retire to the thick stuff and just probably suffer right yeah so for me I, i'd like to see them yeah o- open up baiting but yeah, yeah, I think I think it's me only too. a matter of time. Only a matter of time. So we were chatting about ice fishing, and we, we swear, yeah, swear that's my back to deer. <laughs> I don't know. How I got a, I got a one track mind. Is that what it was? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ask my wife. Um, <laughs> so what's next? You're chasing trout or your walleye am, yeah, on the lake, I, or where well, are you going fishing actually, next? My next day on the water and feel free to tell everyone the lake of the no they give out coordinates there's a perch uh, lake with some pretty pretty (laughs) nice size perch in it in that 13 14 inch range so wow yeah i'm gonna keep this one to myself but there's probably a half a dozen of us heading up uh i'll just say north yeah, yeah, yeah. North. It's, it's a couple hours north of Slave Lake here. more than I was expecting. Beer, and so. uh, it's a lake that's, it's known. It's it's no secret, but uh, you got to do a little homework to figure it out. But yeah, that's my next day. I'll be perch fishing. Hopefully, uh, I went up to this lake last year and I put my fish camera down there and I had nine to 12 inch perch on my camera wow. from sun up to wow. sundown. Big they dumbos. did not move off my camera all day and the only well that's not true they did when a pike would come through yeah and you'd see them all scatter you'd reel up your little jig and you drop down a minnow and just boom and so that's where you're using a a, a jig with a minnow on the end of it uh perch yeah like i find them finicky yeah Yeah, they're really light biting fish i found the camera helps okay for timing Uh, okay light light tackle tungsten jigs and I was tipping it all with like a mealworm or a maggot. And uh, actually, the guy I went with was was hammering him pretty good on the same setup. I just I, he he was just much better at setting the hook than I was. Right, I'm pretty green at perch, but yeah, um, he he I think 
the lake only has a five perch limit, but I think his were all 13 inches or better. Wow. So, and that was last year. Yeah. And the lakes aren't prone to winter kill. So um, okay. if I was to go out on a limb, I'm going to say there's some 15 inches in there this year. Yeah. So you guys fishing pretty shallow, fishing the 12 weeds? 12 feet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's where I start, 12 feet, uh, just on this particular lake. There seems to be a good ledge there where... Um, there's definitely vegetation down there. Yeah. I'm not sure if it shows during open water season or not, but you'll find yourself a little area where there's some vegetations and maybe some cattails down there or whatever. And then you kind of find the edge of it. And when you can get out along the edge of it, you'll find fish kind of cruising back and forth along the edge, looking for bait fish. Right. Nice. So yeah. seems to be a really good spot to set up. Right. Um, like I said, I'm no expert, but we did slam that day. Yeah. <laughs> we really did. I mean, I bet you we caught probably 50 perch each, and I think wow. we each brought home three 10-pound pike too. So that was, you know. That's, that's awesome. Fun. That's the yeah. nice thing about perch. Once you get into them, yep. like, you know, the schools are usually pretty big. Well, and, and the uh, beauty about technology nowadays is, like, it's like those ads say, like, Grandpa used to be the fish finder. I don't know how he did it. Yeah. Because... Like for me I, to go out and stumble on this lake and f instantly find fish, that seems like a needle in a haystack. But now you drill a hole, drop your camera down, spin it Look around. around so that's that's what you're doing. Are you Absolutely. drilling a bunch of holes and going to each I one? I fished the first hole I drilled all day. This when you uh, went yep. to this lake last when time. When I went last year, and I you fished just one you hole just hit a yeah. hit the gold mine right there. I, it might have been better nice. elsewhere, but I just I saw fish yeah, and I said, there. it's frigging cold out, so I want to get my yeah. tent set So you up, aren't so. using a flasher, you're just using no, the camera? No, the guy I was with had a flasher, though. Okay. He swears by it, yeah. but I I have never used one, so, you know, like I was just, I was having better luck watching the fish come up, kind of inspect it. And the beauty about the camera is like, especially for walleye fishing on Slave, they're picky. Yeah. yeah, those fish are, when you yeah. can see them on a camera. Yeah, there's so many <laughs> times when you're out there on that lake thinking, "Oh man, there's no fish here." But in reality, there is a six pound walleye or a yeah. four pound walleye or whatever with its nose a centimeter from your hook, but it's just one shade of color wrong, so it just won't touch it. But with that camera, you just reel up, change color, drop it down, still won't touch it. Reel up, change color, drop it down, instant. Strike. And you don't notice that until you and have a camera or something like okay, that. Absolutely. I wonder how many days I sat on that lake thinking, man, there's no fish here. Yeah. And they were just all swimming. And not to mention that, but the white fish that are down there and tulipy and stuff swimming around. Like, wow. There's a ton of fish in that lake that you just don't this catch. This is your perch lake. No, no, this is slave. You're talking yeah, slave. This is yeah, slave. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like last year, I couldn't get over the amount of white fish and tulipy down wow. there. Yeah, and uh, just amazing the fish that you see swimming around that you just don't catch. That's cool. So, does your camera does it have a recording feature? To no, record? but what that I've would be so learned cool. to do is get a little tripod on the ice, set up with my camcorder, oh, okay, and yeah, then yeah. I just record the screen. Yeah. But yeah. what I will be able to do now with the ice shack is I'll have it tied into a TV. Oh, okay, nice. So we'll be able to watch it on the big on screen, screen, and then I'll just be able to record it off that, right? Yeah. That's so, pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that'll be cool. And, it would and be, the kids love that, right? When yeah. they can come in there and be warm and actually see the fish swimming around. and Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for that. So Nice. So it's going on slave? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll and stay. And you're fishing 25, 30 feet of water? For yeah, walleye. honestly, man, it, it doesn't seem to matter out there. Okay. Um, I won't say what exact spot I fish in, but I no, fish no, on no. the West Basin. It's Bay a big lake. Yeah. Um, there's lots of people that are, you know, it's a yeah. very common spot that people go to, but I mean, I don't want to ruin it for the locals there that fish it. But, and so will you, like, if you're having a bad day with nothing, will you move your shack throughout the day? I won't move my shack, no. but I will go set up off a, a little, little grid pattern. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll for a little walk or yeah. something. Yeah. 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 Just get a, maybe a 20 meter by 20 meter square in yeah. the ice and just drill a grill pattern every couple meters and, you know, stick one down and leave it on a jaw jacker, go drill the next one yeah. and then sit there and jig for a while and then kind of move to your next ones. And yeah. Cause you can use two rods, right? That's in right. Alberta yeah. or at least up during here. ice fishing, season. during ice fishing yeah. season. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, mm. it's nice to have that jaw jacker going. I mean, especially if you're fishing for food. Yeah. Right. I mean, that ups your chances quite a bit, but, uh, uh, Slave Lake's pretty good, man. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty easy to get on fish out there, especially if you're fishing the West Basin during ice season. I mean, the fish all move that way because from what I understand, they spawn in the West Basin because that's yeah. where all the water yeah. comes into the lake, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe they're all on their journey west right now. So, you know, nice. you get out of that narrows, you're going to 
you're probably going to have some pretty good fishing regardless if you're in 27 or 32 feet right but um my magic number i like to be on the top of the shelf okay yeah. I, I like to be on the top part of it myself so 27 29 feet i like that so going out there early on do you sort of know where that shelf is or are you going to drill oh, yeah. a bunch of holes no and find i it? i've got a gps on my phone you've Just, got coordinates yeah yeah absolutely. really yeah. Eh? Nice. oh yeah that's no the way to do it. that's what we yeah. did last year yeah, too, yeah. honestly uh, i don't know if there's a huge stump down there or yeah. some contour or, okay. and i'm sure it changes like yeah. the sand, I mean, the sandbars must change throughout the year. For but, sure. Uh, there, it, there just seems to be something at this spot. And I've fished it for years and years now because we've wow. got a lake lot down there. And it just seems to produce. So well, we caught a few nice and... ones last year when we went out with you. Yeah, yeah, that's the same I think spot. We've got, I think we got three or four that were right around that three, four pounds. And that was that's tough, I remember. That was a tough yeah. day of fishing. That was it. I think that's yeah. all we caught, but they yeah. were good-sized walleye. Yeah, no, they're always pretty good there. But the earlier you can get out there, I find the better. Nice. Uh, obviously not too early. I mean, there's not. you got to make sure it's safe. But yeah, um, I, I find the first, the first little bit of ice fishing is really good. Yeah, well, I've seen some guys are pulling up some nice ones on yeah. Slave already. I noticed uh, Is that just right? the other day on Facebook, yeah. Oh, good, good. Quadding out there, hiking or whatever. Actually, right? I saw a buddy of mine on Facebook caught about a, looked to be about a 12 or 14 pound rainbow trout there this morning. Wow. Yeah, Holy through shit. the ice and it was, uh, he's a good dude. He's, That's uh, a big rainbow. Yeah, he's a, he, he does a lot online for the fishing groups, yeah. ra raffles and stuff nice. for kids and whatnot, right? So. It's good to see him hammer a big one. I've never caught a fish that big, but That's like huge. I said, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping to this year, right? Like I got, I'm starting to get the gear together to to do it and, you know the kids are getting old enough to tag along so yeah hopefully that's the, yeah that's that's the that's key important. to it all for guys like us eh? yeah getting the kids involved is 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 pretty cool man yeah so when are you getting your shack out i don't know i gotta do a little floor repair yeah, on fix my shack. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah i don't know if it'll get out this year or not oh really no but <clears throat> i'm still gonna do lots to do. of fishing i got yeah. a couple tents and no, so nice. do and everything so yeah they're handy yeah. yeah i'd like to i'd like to go hit those smaller lakes though we'll like have to get a little team event going purge, yeah. Yeah. in the new year i know i'm off from the second of january till the Kay. 15th so i know that's maybe we'll plan typically a, day, a pretty good time to go sunday right? or saturday, saturday and get out, there, get out. Yeah. yeah there's a there's a number of lakes up there that are so stocked. Is it, i mean it's they're not secrets they're they're all in the fish stocking program right but yeah. uh they're, they're producing pretty decent this year i'll just say that and so are you hiking in or quadding in they're or? all quad access okay yeah yeah, there's one that's a hike in, but I haven't gone there in years. I, I last time I went in there, I ended up. We won't get into it, but it cost me a razor, oh, <laughs> a nine hundred razor. So, wow. yeah, it uh, it didn't work out good. It, some of this stuff is pretty <laughs> tough to get to. Yeah, but. well, a lot of those they stock them by air too. Yeah, that's this one. That's yeah, this super one was, cool. Yeah, yeah, actually the. The fella who told me about it is the guy who is responsible for getting it stocked. Oh, okay. He and his wife worked their whole careers for the Alberta yeah. Fish and Wildlife, I, I would expect. Yeah. And he owns the trap line out there. Yeah. So he's got a cottage on that lake and said, hey, why don't you stock my lake, hey? <laughs> now, yeah. Now it's got six-pound rainbows and four-pound brookies. That's in it, so. awesome. Well, I got some intel the other day from someone who is involved in all this and works for you know the government or that sort of stuff. And um, they're starting to stock walleye in some really? lakes. Really? No yeah, way. yeah. Like um, locally? Yes, yeah, some local ones. Hmm. The, the ones that have winter killed in past. And, um, and they're doing a lot more trout stocking now. Um, they're making it more of a priority to, for people to catch more fish. And just, you know, putting fishing a little higher on the, the priority list of things. And I was super glad we to hear that. We have so much water in lakes here. It's yes. crazy that Alberta doesn't have a freshwater fishing um, tourism yes. industry. Like, and we really don't. And from what I understand, that's what they're, that's what they're really trying to build up. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. That a, would, you know. a good friend of mine, now that you say that, it kind of puts, this, you know, everything's kind of making sense to me here because I was down at a friend of mine's house this uh, summer and he... He actually runs the Raven Brood Trout Stocking Station. Okay. So he basically is one of the guys responsible for stocking all the trout in Alberta, wow. right? So he took me in his uh, his fish hatchery and he showed me where they made, uh, like they they harvested the eggs from the female brook trout and mixed them with the the, uh, the the brown trout to be fertilized to make tiger trout. No and, way. Oh, it was really That's cool, awesome. man. And he, he they, they, on that property, there's actually a freshwater spring creek. Okay. And all of the brood hens, yeah. once they've expired, 
for breeding purposes, he releases them all into this creek, and it's only like two or three feet deep, but it's just cold, crystal clear water. Yeah. And it has bridges all across this creek, so you can walk across these bridges and look down, and there's 30-pound oh. rainbows <laughs> swimming around, and like 10-pound <laughs> ten, ten brook trout, and just bright colors. Yeah, and wow. like, yeah, he said uh, that there's actually, I thought there was 250 30 pounders set to be released in Alberta, I believe wow. he said this year. That's a, there's a few new world ran, records uh, just at random ready lakes, to be hey, caught. They take a few here, take a few there, and just throw a couple 30 pounders in the mix. Wow. That's crazy. Just to let them live out the rest of their days in, in the wild. Hey? That is. Well, that's it's really a, neat, like hearing a guy that educated about it. And I mean, yeah. it's guys like that that are going to be, you know. You got your little keeping, inside scoop there. Yeah, well, and the thing cool. is, is that I believe that these guys guys even get to go fish them after they release wow. them hey yeah, like the, a out. select group of them they they say okay we're gonna Test we're gonna out. throw 50 in this lake let's go fish it for Test the weekend, out right? the waters yeah and they're all avid fly fishermen and yeah. like super knowledgeable like uh like this guy in particular he i told him i bought a bear bow a recurve bow and he's you know a couple days later in the mail there was bow strings for it that he made at home right like he just flanged them up and sent them up to me wow. with like a stringing kit and all this stuff because he heard i got into traditional and just a good dude so well wow. i seen some photos with you and your family at one of the fish hatcheries that was the one a year or two ago or something yep. like that that's yeah. the same one yeah it's that's pretty incredible, cool man. did yeah. they have sturgeon there too no just trout all okay. trout i think they only had rainbows and brookies but he was showing me all the different pens where they'd have like 2,500 little little trout going, and he'd be like, oh, yeah, this is going to this lake, and then we'd go to the wow, next one. Eh? They'd be a little bigger, and yeah, these are 20.7 centimeter or whatever, and these are going to that lake. And it's just, I think that'd be really cool. That eh? is super cool, yeah. man. Yeah. Super, so, super cool. I guess it's neat to see where they all come from because literally he was showing me some of the fish that were headed up this way. So Wow. Who knows if I saw the fish that I'll be catching this winter. Yeah, Hopefully. no doubt. That's Actually, awesome. I won't be catching them. I'll be... <laughs> it'll be who i bring fishing yeah, that catches yeah. Them. yeah that's, that's how it goes, goes though yeah. usually for me start yeah. drilling holes and yeah jigging other people's rods getting yeah. fires going cooking yeah. cooking yeah. lunch and getting kids untangled yeah. yeah that is too cool when's your first time you're planning on going getting out, out? well uh, i had a dream the other night oh, that i was fishing on the lake and caught a giant walleye really and so i woke up i'm like i gotta go fucking ice fishing <laughs> this is telling me i got to and you know what honestly it hasn't been very high in the priority list like the last three or four years just because if i got a day a lot of times i'll just go out check cameras or do whatever i gotta do in the bush um but the wife loves fishing um, Jackson, he's even old enough now where he can come fishing. Um, so the fishing is starting to go a little higher in the priority list. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Um, but, uh, I love my time in the bush too, but you know, if we can sneak out and catch some, uh, brookies or rainbows early in January, that'll, uh, that'll be it. And I think it would be super cool to film a cool episode and oh, video, absolutely. um, of all that, you know, get some nice aerial shots, get some video of us catching fish. Yeah. And, speaking uh, of a I fishing, think it'll be very cool. Yeah, speaking of a fishing video, I would love for this summer when the water clears up after the runoff and everything, for us to go all grayling fishing together. Yeah, oh, that'd be awesome. Uh, I got a few spots that are just awesome to walk on that yeah. river where you can just just literally walk the whole day and wow. every little pocket you just catch nice little grayling and yeah, you know it's just it's just a really nice day and the footage would be great because it's just a beautiful setting and. That would I, be I think it'd be cool. really fun for us so all to this, do that. Wh which river? A local one here? Swan River. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Swan River, just at the very <laughs> top end. Yeah, So, because my dad used to fish for grayling when he was a kid, just some of these ones south of town. Yes, here. and we actually just got some oh, grayling yeah. in yeah. the other day. A guy's had in his deep freeze for like 10 years. Yeah, or but there it doesn't was. seem to be any around anymore. Oh, I heard there, there is. Mm -hmm. I've we, seen them. But actually, me and uh, Stefan, okay, yeah, when yeah. we were bear hunting, we yeah. found some in a beaver pond you've seen them just off yeah we saw them wow and there was hmm. I've, obviously the creek ran right beside it and they were just stuck in the beaver pond but well, yeah that's pretty cool them. yeah yeah that swan river is just infested with them up the river yeah. oh, it, really? it really is yeah i mean really? it's not easy to get to you gotta walk but there there are some really nice pools there you can get some six seven foot deep pools at the top of that right at the top of swan hills and yeah like i mean are they big really they're, they're not little? huge but I would say the average one would be eight inches, but I've caught fifteen and sixteen inches out of there. Wow! So like a pound and a little yeah, bit. just a, just about a pound. Yep. Yeah. So yep. there's a pretty healthy population of absolutely. Well, they're they're, they're no keep, right? If, if you're catching yes, uh, if you're catching pound grayling, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I, 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 last time I 
uh, fish grayling was in the Yukon. Actually, the only time I've ever fished grayling is in the Yukon. Oh, okay. Yeah. But we were, I caught some, like, three pounds. Yeah, they're, they're noticeably <laughs> bigger up wow. there. In a big lake, like, yeah. That's, That's like a dream hunt for me, is getting it's... up north for, for moose and just, oh, I'm going to throw the old rod well, in this river while I'm doing it. Well, I was working for a sheep outfit, so yeah, I was in sheep go. camp, and uh, I was just wrangling horses, so I was It just looks camp. too good not to cast a rod. Yeah, nice. so I had my, my fly rod. I took the dog down there. Do you the dog do a lot of fly, fly fishing? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, right I'm on. Just, yeah getting into it actually the last couple of years but yeah see that's like awesome. coming from back east that's all we had for being in the outdoors right there's very small big game population there there's some bears a little couple deer so fly fishing huge back east well right? i got Atlantic into fly salmon. fishing because i went to the, i was going to the mountains so it's oh, easy to pack course. a fly rod yep. On, yep. on the horse and yeah. some of the best fly fishing out exactly. there too yeah, yeah. Especially wow. you get on those cutthroat streams and stuff yeah. like that. That's, yeah. that's pretty fun. I didn't catch, fun. there was big lake trout in that lake I was fishing, but I was just fishing right beside a little stream that came out. Yeah. And, uh, Catching when those, when those big, uh, well, there's, there's big lake trout and, uh, I never caught any of them cause I was using a fly, but I was catching grayling. Nice. And they were one and two pounds and three pound. Sweet. Like, that's awesome. Some big ones. I have some pictures of some big ones, yeah. but. A three pound grayling. When, that's when they going turn on the wall. <laughs> in the, in the, in the current. When they turn their big fin, yes. it's just like it's they're bulldogs. Like an eight pound fish. They man. are, yeah. And especially in a fly rod, that's what, just what weight right fly over. rod do you use? Is it like a just a little one, like a four or five weight or something? No, or I not? think it's eight. Oh, okay, so yeah. it's a fairly big. It's a rod, bigger yeah. one because I want to use it on this lake too. I want to try right. a walleye fishing. Yeah. Fly. Oh so man, I honestly, a that's what I do. And yeah. I use uh, in the summertime. I take my fly rod out and I bottom bounce with a fly rod. Really? Oh yeah, really? catching wow. a fifteen catching a fifteen pound pike on a fly yeah. rod doesn't matter. That's what I've heard. You got no drag. It's yeah. ten times more fun than just sitting there with twenty pound braided Never line really and a considered stiff rod. That, yeah. You get. I mean, anyone can just reel it to the surface, right? Yeah. You get out there and catch a six or seven pound, yeah, even a six or seven pound wall, uh, pike, man. Yeah. Yep. And you got a four weight fly rod with six pound line on it and a little tippet. I mean, you're twenty minutes getting it in. Yeah. Right. And so you feel it every and you feel every head yeah, shake yeah. and it runs and I mean, you know what it's like walleye. I mean, if you, half yeah. the time you don't know if you got a log on there or a fish, right? So. Yeah. At yeah, I've heard that from a lot rod. of guys who fly fish. They say fly fishing for pike is just it's something else. It's unreal. Yeah. yeah, it is. I've it never is. touched a fly rod in my life. I've never oh, caught a really? pike with yeah. it, but I've done some with like a big fr- frog fly. Yeah. Thing okay. Whatever, but yeah, I've never yeah. actually caught one. Oh, it's fly fun. Rod. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. Wow. Yeah, it's it, you get the top water little buzz baits, or you get yeah. the like you said the frogs or the mouse or whatever spinners, too, and you yeah. throw it in a weed. You get a weedless setup, and you throw it right on top of some weeds in the shallow water, and they come right out of the water at it. It's awesome. There's some pretty pretty amazing videos. Uh, you go into a what do they call it? A wormhole on YouTube? Oh yeah, or whatever, <laughs> um, of uh, top strike, um, right? Um, yeah, pike. Oh, okay, Northern yeah, yeah. Pike like striking surface. Yeah. There's some pretty crazy cool. videos yeah. of, of yeah. pike catching. I love bait. fishing for pike, man, just because they fight like hell, and you yeah. have a, there's a good chance you can catch a big 15, 20 pounder. You well, know, and the last day I spent on the ice last year, I was packing all my stuff in, and the guy next to us reeled in a 23 pounder right next to us. Wow. Literally on the scale, I saw it with my own eyes. Twenty three pounds. That's a that's a big pike coming yeah. out of Slave Lake. You don't see him twenty three pounds that no, often. Like maybe 15, 16. Yeah. yeah. That was huge. Like yeah. it was a big fish. Like wow. Yeah, like the kids ran right over to it, and like buddy yeah. was like, "Holy cow!" Right? I got like, a I got a buddy from the states that uh, he's got an interesting way of fishing northern pike. Oh. He uses a, a pitchfork. Oh yeah. They yeah. go out and I won't say where because I don't think it's legal, but they go out and cut a big square and they have a big like one of those two vestibule uh, tents, like yeah. the bigger ice oh, fishing yeah. tents. And they dark it out, right? So you cut your big square open with a chainsaw wow. or whatever. You're fishing shallow water then? And then, yeah, they go yeah. in like six feet of water or four feet of water, whatever. And then they just like chum the water. And throw well, <laughs> I know they do that fish for sturgeon down in the States in a lot of places. Do they, they spear eh? fish for, spur- for sturgeon, I think. Dude, over the ice, that'd be believe, awesome. Yeah. Well, I have someone on Facebook like talking about that. He just made one for Pike, he said. And it's like a... Uh, it's like a giant pitchfork. Yeah. Yeah. And he said it's for Pike. I got yeah. a buddy that used to live down south in Brooks. He's an older fella. And he said back in the day when he was a kid, back in like the 70s or whatever, they'd have the, I guess they were reservoirs or what, whatever would overflow and they'd fill all these drainage ditches. So he said as a kid, he can remember going into these drainage ditches and just grabbing pitchforks and and taking like 10, 15 pound pike home on the pitchfork, eh? And just throwing them up on the bank. He said they would just be everywhere, right? That's crazy. I would, I wish, I wish we could spearfish our lake. 
Like I wish that the water was clear enough that you yes. could actually like spear these, fish these trout lakes are. That would the, be the so Brookie Lake is yeah. nice because you fish in about four or five feet of water, yeah. right? So you see everything. Yeah. But oh, I mean, wow. like, like underwater snorkel. Oh, fish. really? Like, that'd oh, be, oh, that. that'd be cool. oh, that'd be cool. That would be so yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> Can you awesome. imagine going to some of those lakes up north, like Peerless, and where there's, there's some fish. real yeah. monsters Giant up there? Like, pike. There's some 40 pound Like 30, lake 40 trout pound lake. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be freaky. Yeah, in the deep water, too. Because I think yeah. that lake gets 90 feet or something yeah, like that, something I believe. Like that. Yeah, it's super deep. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. No, I'm pretty excited to get out on the hard water. I mean, I'm a little tentative still. It's. I went out once in Swan Hills and there was about eight inches and my day was pretty short. I'm a little uncomfortable. I mean, yeah, uh, it's not just not worth it to me, I yeah, guess, no, at that point, yeah. right? But uh, it's it's getting close. I'm pretty. I'm getting the itch now that we're talking about it for sure. Yeah, That's I got good. the. I'm getting the itch too. I actually, I'm getting my sled out of summer storage today. Oh, nice. I'm getting nice. ready to go. Yeah. Right on. Well, we'll have to plan something for early January. Yeah, to that'll be cool. There. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm in fishing mode, but I got to say, I saw someone post today online about shed hunting, and that just swung me right around into deer mode again. Yeah, so you do a lot of shed hunting? No. No. I started last year, and I am terrible at it, I found out. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I didn't find many, but, uh, you know, it does teach you a lot. Yes. Um, And it gives you an opportunity to go into those areas where you probably shouldn't be going at a time where it's not really going to affect your hunting season. You know, you're in there in March mm-hmm. or whatever, or February. That's a long time from hunting season. So, uh, I don't know. I'm new to it. I, I know one thing. I found a match and set this year. Wow. And it was, a, I scored it uh, with a 20 inch spread. I scored it at 156 inches net. That's so a good deer. Holy that was, smokes. That was on the property that I'm, I'm hunting. So, hopefully, uh, I, I got to be honest, that deer is probably declining now, but whatever. I mean, it's good genetics anyway. So. Well, again, I'm coming down to like these bush bucks, man. Like there are, there's 500 trails that they use. Yep. You know what I mean? So it's tough to just find a fucking shed. I find like I spent tough. Yeah. I spent a few days too each year. I'll go and just just wander, check all my cameras, and check out some new spots hiking. And and uh, like I've maybe found one or two. Yeah. So no so real hard. technique to it or anything. There's not, man. Yeah. I, I don't mean, know. I don't think up here it's no. there really is. They could, they could knock their horn off or antler off on any tree yeah yeah under any tree this might sound ridiculous but i've had more success shed hunting in pitch darkness oh really just stumbling over him well they got a little bit of shine to him this year i ended up sticking a deer on october the 5th and i backed out for the night i found the arrow it was a huge buck biggest buck i've ever shot at with rifle or anything Uh, i got pictures of him he's easily 160 inches wow and Mm -hmm. I, I just missed him. I, I made a bad shot. I didn't miss the deer. I hit the deer, but I missed the vitals. And I went in there early that next morning at first light, and I had my headlamp on, and I was looking down on the ground for blood. And it was almost like the light, it was almost like a halo over top mm-hmm. of that matching set. Oh, I yeah. just walked in and the bush looking for him? blood and there was just the most beautiful matching wow. set of antlers wow. on the ground. And I was just like, okay, well, that's, I guess cool. if I don't find the deer, at least I got this right. Yeah. I mean, I never, I, I literally searched for eight hours straight that yeah. day and I just, you know, it was the day where all the leaves seemed to be falling off the trees yep. and I seemed to just lose every time I'd find new blood, the leaves would cover it up. And I gotta be honest, there were three deer coming through there every night before I stumbled through their bedding mm. area and, to this day, I have not seen any one of those three deer wow. on any of my 13 trail cameras from walking through that area one time. Wow. Yeah. That's and they crazy. are gone. Gone. Yeah. Which is freaky because. That just goes I, to show the footprint you leave, right? Oh, man. It's huge. I mean, it, it's huge. I, I learned so much this year, man. So much. Well, and it's crazy how far those deer can go and, and what they can survive through. Like we've, I, I haven't personally seen trail camera photos of deers with like holster or anything, but I've seen them on Facebook yeah. where guys will have a picture of a deer with an arrow in its back or even like a, a hole sometimes in its back or in its lower leg. And, you know, they are tough, yeah. strong this animals. This deer lost a lot of blood. I'm not sure how it lived. And all I can say is that it was my fault yeah. because I pushed it instead of waiting overnight yeah. before I went in I went in and checked that I had the arrow and then I t- okay well I'll take a few more steps in and you know yeah I grazed one to yep, absolutely to, uh, I so, grazed you know. one under the brisket a couple of years ago with an arrow and uh I was heartbroken about it man and I followed blood the next day and looked and there was like 
spot spot and then there was just nothing and i actually had him on camera later on so that made me feel so much yeah, better yeah see i haven't it's... seen this guy again so i'm still heartbroken over him yeah he could he could just stay out of the, like he yeah. knows that area is danger so he is you know he's yeah. the worst part about it is he brought his two friends who were equally and as they're impressive. gone now too yeah. Yeah. wow yeah. Eh? Yeah. yeah they were a bachelor group at the time they went everywhere together any camera they came across they were together and then i shot that guy that night and I went in there, and I'm sure that just me putting my scent and my footprint yeah. in there said for those guys, okay, we're out of here. Wow. Hoping they come back next year. That's why I got all the food out there for them. But, yeah. man, I, I made a lot of mistakes this year. I mean, I was successful, but, I, geez, but one's tough. It is. <laughs> yep. It really is, man, when you want to well, get 20 and yards. And sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes it's the best thing you can do is have one tough year where you just okay, learn absolutely. from all Well, I've mistakes. learned more this year yeah, exactly. than any other and year. And me too, yeah. From any successes I've had, I've learned more from this failure this year than any any other successful hunt. Yeah, yeah. the biggest thing I probably learned this year is just waiting after you shoot that animal. Like Huge. when we shot the bear, we waited like Let 45 minutes, an down. hour. It's yeah. so important. Yeah. And I still somehow fail to see how important it is almost every yeah. time i get that excitement and it's uh, yeah you're 100 percent right man yeah. it's almost the most important part of the whole process yeah, yeah. without a doubt and that's something again that john told me man he's like you shoot anything wait an hour he yeah. said at least an hour it doesn't matter how good you think that shot was just wait let that animal bed down somewhere close let it so calm down dies. it's yeah. funny in the video after me shooting the deer this year my dad <sighs> says wait an hour yes and i said no it's already been 20 minutes he says wait I know. an hour <laughs> you know that's the I longest like, I made a good hour shot. i know it's dead like i watched it wait an hour Charlie, it's yeah. the longest that ever. Really, draft what do you have to spend. lose, though? Right? We just got to be able to tell ourselves, okay, no, just sit still. Yeah. And honestly, down. the fact that it wasn't a huge, impressive buck for me this year might have been the thing in my whole journey as a bow hunter to kind of put me over that edge and say, okay, this is how to be successful. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a two-year-old deer or a six-year-old deer. These are the things you have to do year after year if you want to be successful at it, and, and that's one of them. I, I, I know that deer this year I ruined for myself, and I've done it with a deer previously that I shot with a rifle that I just chased too soon. And, yeah. Yeah, and I've know. done it too. We've yeah, all done just, it. Yeah. You just got to you gotta learn from it and not try not to do it again. Yeah. So that being said, like, do you guys have any goals that you set and change each year when it comes to your bow hunts, or you know, do you set out – you know, to start the 2020 season with a goal, Eric, that you're going to shoot a 150 inch deer with your bow and kind of set a date that you're going to try to get that goal until. And then, well, his Brody. starts with S and ends with P. Sheep. <laughs> Sheep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Bro Brody might be a better person to ask about the bow specifically, just because, um, in the last two years, I've really been struggling with my bow because my bow, right. My bow situation right now just isn't right. And so I need to get a new one, and I'm just kind gotcha. of in the transition stage. So yeah. I've sort of given up on the bow. Yeah. Um, I used it this spring, and I had a goal of shooting only a color bear. So whether it be cinnamon to blonde, whatever. Yeah. And uh, that's all I packed with me. I, I never pack a, a gun when I bait or anything like oh, that. Really? I pack bear spray and, and my bow if I'm hunting, and that's it. And so I, that's all I took with me all of bear season was just a bow. And... Uh, I saw You're a brave man. I saw a million bears and I never yeah. saw a color one, so that's just the way it went. And well, you stuck to your guns anyway. And yeah. those color bears there, far and few between. I know you've I been find. trying to get that. Like I think I've had one color bear. See, and I had like, a ton, I had a ton on, on my, my camera. camera, and I had ton, tons of like white crested bears. Yeah, too a lot of white crest on that ones. one that one bait site, but uh, the color ones just, just never came when I was there. For. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I know you got a couple old bucks you're trying to go after. Well, this year, yeah, right? coming back to your question there, you know, getting a velvet white tail with yeah. the bow has been high on my list it for a long for time. A and like I was close to that, like I'd mentioned earlier here a year or two ago, where I just, you know, went right underneath one, skimmed his brisket. Luckily, he survived. I seen him later on. Um, but I was close. Again, this year I tried, um, didn't have an opportunity, didn't have a chance. Um, so that's always my goal. And it's, you know, to try and get something mature, right? I'm not necessarily looking for a 160 or even 150. If I have the opportunity at 130 inch or 140 inch whitetail with the bow and velvet, I'm going to take it every Absolutely. single time. Well, and you got you got lucky and got the opportunity to scratch the, the moose off your list. Yeah, right, and bow, that's, so. that's a bonus. Like yeah. that's just one of those opportunistic 
tags that you always buy just to have in your pocket, yeah, just in case. Yeah. Um, just you're going to buy it every up year. Attention for the rest of the season. Exactly. Once that one's full. And we were talking about that earlier yeah. today before we started the podcast, how I got the moose earlier on. So then the weight is off my shoulders. My freezer is full. Now I can put all my energy into getting a mature buck on film and, and getting one with a bow. Um, Cause once your freezer is full, then you don't have to worry about just getting meat. Yeah. Right. So if you, if you don't get a moose or don't get an elk, well then you're into November and you're at the point where you have nothing in your deep freeze and you're like, man, should I just shoot this doe or this two year old deer just to get some meat? So it's a big relief getting something early on. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that made the season bearable because I went from August 27th to this last day of the season, not getting anything. I missed an elk and that was heartbreaking. Yeah, um, so I went like three months with nothing. Um, but the fact that I did have a moose in the deep freeze, it made it a little bit, uh, more bearable, but, uh, you know, when you go that long in a hunting season that you've been waiting for all year, it's always frustrating as hell. But, uh, yeah, so that's but, my goal every year is a velvet yeah, yeah. white tail. My, my goal for the last couple of years to circle back to the bow thing again is uh, I would really like to do sheep with a bow, and I wish I could have the first year I went, but I just wasn't prepared with my bow. And like I said, I've been struggling for struggling with it for a couple of years. So once I get this new one, um, my goal is going to be to take it to the mountains for sheep you shoot a sheep with a bow, you're setting yourself apart. Well, and when when we did the first sheep hunt, we saw two massive mule deer, like in oh, full cool. velvet, and uh, they're open for archery in the mountains. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Like, oh. I definitely could have killed one with my bow. I wow. was within oh, bow range. I really? That's and we crazy. contemplated taking the bow, but we just, with the weight and oh, we yeah. packed everything, we just didn't. Yeah. So uh, this go around, if I have my bow set up and I'm tuned in, I'm definitely nice. taking it to the mountains yeah. for sheep and uh, yeah, and the without mule deer. a doubt, yeah, yeah you, it's it's so important just to have trust and just have the you know just to believe like your bow for example, you, you just aren't feeling good about it. I just you don't, don't you trust don't know it. what's not... wrong with it. You can't pinpoint it to one thing. It just it doesn't feel good. Yeah. You don't trust it. And that's how I was with mine, right? And then I got this new one from APA, and this thing shoots like a freaking dream. I was telling him I raised my my poundage up 12 pounds, and it's still smoother than my last yeah. one. I can draw it back better. And I just, I feel good about it, yeah. you know? I feel good about shooting this, where the last one, I, something just didn't feel good, you know what I mean? And yeah, I could I could hit a target at... 40 or 50 yards where I want to hit, but it just, I didn't have a good feeling about it where when you have total faith in the, the weapon you're using, you know, you go into that hunt with a totally different mindset. Well, oh, if you absolutely. go into something that you aren't sure about, you know, you're drawing that arrow back and, and you're already doubting your bow, you know what I mean? And so you're just well, starting things off. And I'm just a, not good. I'm a bow hunter by blood, like for sure. Bow hunting is definitely priority for me over rifle hunting. Absolutely. Like 100% of the time. Um, so for me to even think about packing my bow when I don't trust it, yeah, it's just not an option. No. So I go straight to the rifle and like, um, when I was younger and I first got into hunting, I wasn't even old enough to pack a gun by myself. So I solo hunted with a bow all really? the time and that's cool. all I ever did. That's like awesome. From the age of 15 till I was 18 and I could finally carry a gun. Yeah. So, I always pack the bow, and I still do if I have a bow that I trust. So you've been hunting with a bow for quite a while, then. That's that's how I started hunting. Cool. Yeah, myself. Well, I remember the first video that you guys gave me was a spot and stock bear filmed with a GoPro, yeah, and they killed it with a bow. Is that yeah. right? Eh? I shot it with my compound bow. Yeah. My backup. My backup was my camera guy with a recurve that he yeah. <laughs> shot a handful like of I'm times. Like, I'm watching this. I'm like, Jesus <laughs> oh, Christ. Yeah. 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 God hates coward. Yeah, yeah no right. doubt. We did it. We got it. And it was yeah. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. actually on YouTube. You that's awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, so, like, I, I've always been crazy about bow hunting. It's just right now a matter of tuning and getting everything back together. And then I'll be back on the bow and put the gun away. Yeah, sweet. Well, that's good part of off season i suppose yeah. get all dialed back in well yeah. that's the thing i want to i really got to go see some people at apa i think and uh, shoot some bows i got one coming soon well and that's a nice thing soon. about about them is they're in saskatchewan right so yeah. you can go right down to their factory yeah. i think that's i think that's the uh the move i think that's yeah. the plan yeah. go see nabal the guy who started it all the mastermind behind everything you can go see the guy that designs those yeah. bows you know try out 
shoot all the right in their ones. facility. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and what's yeah. cool is like when I got my bow, they tune it all for you. They sent me a piece of paper that's saying exactly how fast my bow is shooting, what they've tuned it to, all the specs. And so, oh, you know, cool. as soon as you receive that, that thing's ready to fire, man. So not only are you getting a bow, you're getting a whole experience you're getting too. The whole, oh, all yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's it's cool. really nice. Yeah. I'm looking forward to getting mine. Yeah. But I think the key to it all, I guess, regardless of what you're using is, is practicing with it. Yeah. I know that was the biggest mistake I made this year. I didn't practice enough and it, it cost me yeah. and it cost that deer I shot at. It yeah, it, yeah. it honestly kills me that I can't shoot my bow. Like yeah. I usually I shoot my bow like five times a week. Like and honestly, mm. guys, I just if I'm being honest, I don't have that itch to shoot my bow all the time. It's I love guy. bow hunting, yeah. but I find it very hard to get motivated to practice. Well, it's tough, and especially this time of year when you gotta shovel a path through three feet of snow mm-hmm. just yeah. so you can go get your arrows That's back right. and forth. But yeah. I just but I've I just learned made a point of it to do it this year. I I. I it's just really important to practice. I don't yeah. ever want to feel that way again. Like that day yeah. after I couldn't find mm-hmm. that buck, knowing that he's running around with a hole in the side of him, suffering in pain, and it's all my fault because yeah. I didn't practice hard enough. Like mm-hmm. knowing that, that ate, that just killed me for days. Yeah. And and it's never, hard break. I it's, never want to feel that again. No. It wouldn't have mattered if it was a spike buck That's or I a felt giant. That's why I this year, yeah, man. Well, it's heartbreaking. And I yeah. missed an elk too with my bow. Yeah. Like, just seeing how I much it bled. Clean, but it's like, come on. Like yeah. You should have, like. Yep. It's, just one more thing, one more scenario of practice, and I wouldn't have made that mistake. Whatever yeah. it may have been, right? And I mean, you throw a camera in the mix with all this too, yeah. right? So you're well, trying to like coordinate the elk that. Well, like that I, like we were filming it, and I shot, and I ducked and spun around, and the camera's on me. I'm like, yes, I got it, and I was pumped right up. And then the camera's still on me, and I walk up, and like my face, I'm just heartbroken. There's no blood anywhere. Yeah, There's okay. nothing. And then that the was elk's a deflection, just gone. Right? Yeah, like it was, yeah, yeah it, it it was just a shitty situation yeah, is yeah. what it was. Which um, is part of hunting but, you know, much and as then, we hate it. And then you get back to camp and you're just like, what could I have done different? And it just bugs you, man. Like, yeah, so I, I know how, night. you know, I honestly you didn't sleep that night, man. Because, you know, I made the, the biggest sin afterwards. I checked my trail camera to see what buck it was. Oh, okay. Because he walked right by my trail camera right before I shot. Yeah. And I went in and I saw what bucket was that I had oh, just no. shot at, man. And I sat yeah. up all night. Broke your heart. Night, yeah. Man. Yeah. Well, at this point, I still thought I had a chance because uh, I had full pass through, blood yes. all over the arrow. There was good blood for 20 wow. meters back into the bush. Like good blood. Like yeah. real good blood. Like everyone, I posted a couple pictures online and everyone yeah, said that's a dead that. deer. Yeah, I remember seeing And that, that thing, man what it went through and under and over and around man the brush piles that it would dive underneath and creeks it was crossing it went unbelievable what that deer went through after i shot it and after it was in that pain but like i said i just never want to feel that again so if i got to shoot 50 arrows a day every day then that's what i got to do right well it's just like anything else just like learning guitar or anything like that it's it's so hard when you're like meh at it Mm -hmm. right right but then once you once you get dialed in and clicked into it you're like oh this is working pretty good i'm feeling good about it you get all that confidence and then you really want to do it it becomes well and that's something we could always look at as a team too right getting together and kind of sharpening our skills together right like i mean it's gonna improve our odds of harvesting right so yeah without a doubt well i'm gonna dive into this guys today's podcast is brought to you by antler obsession the only big game attractant and supplement designed specifically for elk moose and deer living in a northern climate check out our website go to nontypical.org use promo code podcast for 10 percent off everything including antler obsession supplement and attractant so yeah guys we are at an hour and a half what do you think do you have anything else you want to chat about Closing or? thoughts oh, that's Blue right by I know. Yeah. I'm looking does. at this. I'm like, holy smokes! Yes. We're at an hour and like 25 Actually pretty minutes. Actually, organic there. It always does. Yeah. yeah. Right on. No. Right on. Well, you don't. Do you want to wrap her up, Eric? Uh, yeah, I can wrap it up. Sure. You got any closing thoughts, Charlie? No, I'm good, boys. I'm happy to be a part of this. I'm glad to be here. It was nice talking with you guys about all this stuff. And I, like I said, I got lots to learn in the next year. And I'll get you out calling moose for me oh, if yeah. I get yeah. that priority, yeah. buddy. Anytime, and, man. Uh, Anytime. You can teach me a thing or two. Take me under the wing for yeah. an October week. Yeah, well, Eric and I were talking. We should do a podcast in the ice fishing shack. Yes. Oh, that'd oh, be yes. super cool. We were cool. going to talk about yeah, that. That'd yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah. It would be, it'd be perfect, too. Yeah. It's super easy. Yeah, and there would be no wind or anything, right? Yeah. yeah that'd be really cool. Because we could even cool pan have one of the cameras up on Absolutely. the fish camera. Yeah, we'll film it all and just chat. Yeah. Maybe even have an adult beverage. Yeah, yeah without a doubt. <laughs> oh, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we'll close with that. 
This podcast is also brought to you by Primal Adventures Outfitting and Guide Services. I still have uh, bookings available for 2020 and on for full service moose hunts, rut, and late season, as well as winter wolf hunts. So, yeah, hit up Primal Adventures if you're looking for a Alberta moose hunt. Right on, right on. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Be sure to follow all of our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, subscribe to this podcast, share with your friends, tell them how absolutely amazing it is. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Listening, we really appreciate it. Right on.